Thank you, Merrill, and good afternoon, everybody. As Merrill said, I'll be talking about antenna design for the repack and maximization. And um, as you know, we've just been through a um, filing window, or as I guess it was a few weeks or months ago now. And uh, for that filing, you could get um, a faster processing of your application if the um, antenna uh, did not, uh, if it re replicated the existing coverage area. Therefore, the antenna pattern really needed to match your old pattern. And as I'll show in the uh, presentation, that's not always simple when you're changing uh, frequency, particularly if there's a large change in frequency. At the moment, we're just in or about to be in the expanded filing window. Um, and with that, if you want to maximize your facility, that means if you want to increase your um, coverage, uh, you need to protect adjacent uh, facilities on the same channel. And there's some uh, antenna design techniques I'd like to talk about today uh, to do that. So I'll talk about uh, the replication and some methods, show some examples. Then I'll talk about maximization um, using some traditional methods and using some optimization methods and then uh, comparing the two. So um, the main thing we need to replicate is the azimuth pattern to replicate the coverage. Obviously the elevation pattern is important, but um, for replicating the same coverage, the azimuth pattern uh, is important. So I'll just concentrate on the azimuth pattern design in this paper. And I'll first I'll talk about slotted pole antennas. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with the slot antenna. It's a um, pole, normally steel pole, could be aluminum, um, an inner conductor running up the middle and couplers uh, uh, taking uh, energy from the inner conductor and exciting uh, field across the slots. So here's a pole with four uh, slots in it. So how do we shape the pattern? Um, I'll just this is fairly basic, but this is, these are the basic techniques. Obviously, the number of slots in the pole uh, will make the pattern change. That's a key parameter. The diameter of the pole has an impact on the pattern. The, how you excite the slots, and if you change the amplitude and phase to each slot, uh, you can shape the pattern. Adding wings to the pole, which I'll show later. Adding reflecting grids behind the antenna can give you a cardioid pattern. Uh, mechanical beam tilt as well as electrical beam tilt in combination can shape the uh, pattern in interesting ways. It's a three-dimensional problem. Of course, combinations of all of the above, which often is what ends up happening, especially on complex patterns. So if we change the number of slots, um, a single slot in a pole uh, gives a cardioid pattern. As you can see there, that's a traditional pattern. If we go to two slots, we end up with a peanut pattern. Three slots gives us a trilobe pattern. And four or more slots generally gives an omni. On a smaller pole, it could be three slots. And I mentioned before, changing the pole diameter uh, has an effect on the pattern. Here's a cardioid, uh, cardioid antenna with a single slot. And you can see um, there's four uh, pole diameters there, all one inch in one inch increments. And you can see some variation at, at the back here. And if we need to control uh, this area uh, to not exceed the um, coverage we had before, that um, change in diameter can, can have an impact when you um, there's a peanut pattern that's more sensitive to pole diameter, and a trilobe is also um, sensitive to pole diameter. Changing uh, frequency has a similar effect. The, the change in diameter I'm showing there as a percentage is similar to the percentage of uh, changing frequency from the top to the bottom of the UHF band. Um, you can sort of scale a pole with frequency, but that's the sort of variation. So. This is similar to the sort of variation you might see on cha changing your channel from one end of the band to the other. Obviously, if you have uh, the blue pattern and then you 
end up with the red pattern, you, you're going to have trouble uh, with your replication because the red is exceeding the blue. You can adjust the excitation on the slots. You can, on this one, the front and back slots have got uh, slightly different levels of, of excitation and you can see the yellow pattern is omnidirectional and then where they're all equal power and then uh, the shape's changing as we um, reduce the uh, voltage. We can add wings, uh, generally welded to the pole. Um, that'll give you a cardioid pattern. You can also add reflecting grids that also gives cardioid patterns and gives you more uh, control on, on front to back and, and beam shaping. So that's uh, slot antennas. Um, quite a lot of things you can vary to change the pattern on a slot antenna. And now I'm going to talk about panel antennas. And a panel antenna is a broadband antenna. Generally, they cover the full UHF uh, frequency range. And generally, they're four around, four panels on a, on a mast, sometimes five, sometimes more, can be 12 in some circumstances. The general uh, panel building block is a, is a sector antenna. It has a sector radiation pattern. And ideally, at 40, if this is bore site, where you've got a field strength of one, at 45 degrees, you would want a field strength of half that of 50%. What happens then is the 50% from this one adds to the 50% from this one, and you get one there. It's a vector, basically a vector addition, and you add all the additions of all the panels. And the ones around the back, you normally aim for zero radiation out the back, or a very good front-to-back ratio. If all that's done, you'll end up with an omnidirectional pattern out of that. But if you don't want an omnidirectional pattern, you start changing that. You don't make them all the same. You may move a panel. Uh, you may change the power on one of them or the phase on one of them. And we talk about faces of panel, A, B, C, D. Uh, so, so as I said, you can change the power to one or more faces that will shape the azimuth pattern. You can change the phase. When I say phase, I mean the relative phase, phase difference between them. You can rotate the array, that'll, that'll and, um, change panel positions. It could be a combination of the above. And um, like we, I said, with the slot antenna, you can have a mechanical beam tilt combined with electrical. With a panel, you can actually change the beam tilt on each face. The electrical beam tilting, you get some quite um, interesting and complex patterns in a 3D um, scenario, and we've done another some work on sites like Mount Wilson and others where um, towards the, the water you want a fairly steep down tilt, but in the other up and down the coast you want less beam tilt. And that can shape the patterns and uh, even on some DTS systems it can give very good control. I won't go into a lot of detail about this, it's quite a complex subject and I think uh, Merrill's uh, presented papers on that previously at uh, IEEE. So here's, an, here's sort of shows you what happens when we adjust the power to the panel. So on uh, face A, this one, power is one, so we've got an omnidirectional antenna. As I said, the, the power here sort of adds, and so we've got a peak here. This slight ripple, um, that's fairly standard for a panel antenna. Reducing the power on the front panel um, to 63%, we get a 2 dB reduction. So now we're starting to get an offset omni. Um, pattern, further reduction, we've got a 3D, we've got a, more of an offset on the, now we've sort of got a nice filled-in a filled in cardioid, and with 10 dB we've got a sort of a filled-in cardioid, quite a good pattern. 10 dB is about the practical limit um, of um, doing this power split, and to do this we um, have power splitters feeding the antennas and we design them. so. Uh, some arms have less power coming out of them. To make that work over a wide bandwidth, you don't really want to go beyond 10 dB ratio. And the other option is just totally remove that panel so the power is zero and you, know, you get not much radiation in that direction. You can also change the relative phase. So here they're all fed in phase. We have an omnidirectional pattern. Here we've put uh, plus 60 on the top one, and you see we get this null here. 
So that could be quite good for controlling um, an interference situation where you've got a station in this direction and you need to re reduce ERP in that direction. The only problem is uh, we also have the same, it's symmetrical, so we also have a null here which you may not want. Changing to plus 60, the null flips to this other side. There's the minus, that one, and then the other one will flip over to here. So changing phase, uh, you can get a fair bit of pattern shaping. Changing power in phase, you can get even more shaping. As I said, we've got two nulls there. We don't, may not want this one. So the other thing we could do is change panel position and phase. So here's an example. We've moved the panel sideways and kept the phase, and we've got a nice uh, notch here and still a fairly smooth pattern everywhere else. So that, that could be quite useful for uh, replication. As I said before, um, with replication, uh, you're not supposed to expand the coverage in any direction or uh, reduce the population by uh, more than 5%. So therefore, we really want a pattern having the same, an antenna having the same pattern as the original antenna. Um, it's not always simple. As I showed you before, the pole size or frequency change changes the pattern. Um, the, there's wind codes these days are a little bit tougher, and sometimes you need to step up to a larger pole size that can have an impact. Could be going from a side mount antenna to a top mount antenna. Generally, they have a larger pole diameter because they need to support themselves because uh, they're end mounted. And there were some um, filings which we think could have had uh, been based on test range measurements with errors in them and they, they, you try to replicate that, it's very difficult. So, <laughs> so we've had a few of those <laughs> and come up with some pretty interesting designs to try and match that. So bottom line is uh, these filing windows are fairly short. We need a, a fast method to replicate the patterns, fast and simple if possible. So there's a few methods for doing that, a few options. One is to make a, um, a full-size section of antenna with one or two uh, layers of slots. And this is a fairly uh, well-known approach. Um, as I said, you build a two-layer model or one-layer model, you put it in the test range, take the measurements, change things by hand, file, cut, whatever machine, do it again, repeat. So the, the disadvantage is, um, the advantage is it's, it's long established, known method, people accept it. Um, the disadvantage is the time that it takes to make these modifications, which limits the amount of changes you can make, things you can try. And you can get some assembly errors when you, you're making lots of changes to pieces and always re reassembling. The other method uh, which is, is coming into common use is an electromagnetic model, a 3D model. Um, it's an electromagnetic simulation, uh, or we call it sometimes a virtual prototype. No metal needs to be cut. It's all built in uh, software. And the pros of that is it's fast. Um, you can do a lot of experiments in a short amount of time, which makes, means it's suited to design automation. You can see the full picture of what's going on. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but the cons is you need a fairly powerful computer or bank of computers if you're going to do a lot of these um, simulations and experiments. You also need experience. An engineer, you, you can trip up if you make certain assumptions and you don't have experience using this stuff. Um, so you just got to be careful there. So there's our, our 3D model, we analyze it and it can give us the radiation pattern, the azimuth pattern, it can give us the impedance, it can give us the variation with frequency and uh, one of the good things is it shows us what the fields look like inside the antenna and that is a very useful um, tool to have because things in slots can go wrong as you, with fields as you get bigger and start penetrating uh, couplers and things inside. And it's, very difficult to see the slots with the human eye, so it's very useful having that in software. We generally, um, after we make a model like that, we validate it to make sure that it's accurate because obviously if it's not accurate, it's uh, not much use to us. So this is an example. We might make a, a model that's a five-sided broadband panel antenna 
uh, electromagnetic model. Um, often we'll do a single layer test to, to validate it. And then when we build the full antenna, we'll do a full far field uh, antenna range test on that. So that was all the same antenna going through those steps. So how accurate is it? Um, there's, and this isn't, this isn't the antenna I showed you before. This is a slot antenna. Um, I think it's a 24 bay. And you can see the green is the electromagnetic model and the red is the measured uh, on our test range. It's a very, very good correlation. And this is the slide I showed you before with um, the panel antenna. And you can see there's a, um, the green is the model, the blue is the full <coughs> antenna measured on the test range, red is the single layer uh, data. The interesting thing is the green and the blue, the full final antenna and the model match very well. If you look up at the top there, got very good correlation. But the red's not so good. And the reason for that is errors in the physical single layer model, just tolerances and things. Um, they, when you make the full antenna, those tolerances sort of all even out because they're random, random errors. So as I said before, having this tech tool that um, allows uh, the ability for design automation and automation, sorry. So um, what we do is we use an optimizer and we put a set of um, performance goals in there and seek the best solution. Example, replicating an existing pattern. Um, optimizers are like EM simulators. It's, it, with an inexperienced engineer, you can get into trouble. You'd say, I'll just vary everything and let it do all the work. Really, you, you need to start off with a, a rational design and limit the uh, variables and, and try not to do crazy things. But um, you really need an experienced antenna engineer, but it does speed up uh, the productivity, increase the productivity a lot. So you basically, you enter a target pattern, you enter the optimization goals. Um, so in this case, it would just be match the existing pattern, do not deviate from it. It could be multiple goals on certain angle ranges. It might be more important to match the pattern. So you can uh, optimize over a range of azimuth angles and put a weighting factor on that if they're more important. Um, you tell it what you want to change. It could be the slot length or the pole diameter wing length, etc. Um, then you simulate, compare it, and then the optimizer basically looks at the result and uh, makes an adjustment and runs it again. So here we can see um, it's, it's not a one-dimensional problem, it's a multi-dimensional problem. So we have a surface and you can see here's the optimum here. And um, you can see this is the first point, then the optimizer's gone down the slope, and then down the slope, and then it's overshot, and then gone back, and finally settles on the, the optimum uh, goal. Um, there's different types of optimizers. Some might find a local minimum, might actually hone onto this and lock in there. So um, you use different optimizers, which global or, or not, which can find the best uh, position. So here's an example of the process. Uh, we start off, we want this uh, certain pattern that's a C170. That's our spec. The optimizer go, does its thing, and you can see the pattern's changing until it um, matches the spec pretty well. We, we generate the error by looking at the absolute difference between the target pattern and what we're, each, we're getting out of our simulation. And this one here is within the limits that we set uh, for the variation, and that's the azimuth angle along the bottom, and that's uh, meeting the target there. And this is another, this is the goal value. This shows like the progress as it's going along, and you set a limit um, down here, and once it reaches this limit, it's basically a, a number that tells you what, what's going on. It's, across the whole angular range. Once it's, you reach that limit, limit, it stops. So there's the blue dotted line is the target, and the purple is what the optimizer came up with. 
and then that's what we measured on, on our uh, indoor test range. So very, very good correlation. So next I'll talk about maximization. Um, if you want to maximize, you can increase your ERP, but you're not, to, not supposed to interfere with uh, neighboring stations on the same channel. Um, so what that means is ideally you might want an omnidirectional antenna with a notch in it towards that station. Or if there's two stations protected, you might want two notches. So you want maximum ERP in the other directions. So we can use the same tasks or we can modify the, the techniques I talked about before. So here's an example of a slot uh, antenna example. This was a top mount antenna, uh, slot, elliptical polarization. We needed protection in two directions. And we were supplied with a template like this, which um, sort of showed us what to aim for with the pattern, try and keep the pattern below this red uh, template. So here's the optimizer varying. We, we had three parameters, you know, it might be slot position, wing length or something. Um, there were three of them and you see them varying uh, as it goes along. This is the uh, simulation number along the bottom. This is the corresponding radiation patterns. <coughs> <coughs> so you can see a whole lot of different patterns, uh, intermediate patterns as it goes. Here's the goal value, it starts off um, not, not too good, drops down, keeps going down until it hits this target, target level. And there's the final pattern, so the red is the uh, envelope we need to keep within, and the purple is the um, final pattern. <coughs> Here's the uh, final pattern in polar form. Um, the red is the uh, envelope, the blue is the, the pattern that was achieved. Um, so that was a slot antenna. There's a lot of, um, quite a few variables in a slot antenna, so um, it can be quite time consuming if you do it by manual methods, so the optimizer helps us a lot on that. Here's a panel antenna um, example. This is a broadband antenna. It's a shared, uh, obviously shared site. There were four or five stations to go into this antenna. It was an elliptical polarization, of the antenna. One channel had to protect stations to the north and to the southwest. This is on the uh, east coast of the USA. <clears throat> and we were asked, we were challenged, in fact, by Merrill, to maximize ERP in all directions except up to the limit when we start going over a certain interference um, target. So try for a megawatt in every direction, but not in to go above a certain interference target. And the other stations, the other four, um, unfortunately, they, they're all omni, so we don't want to wreck we don't want to change the pattern too much from Omni. We want to minimize the changes from Omni for these other stations. So we start off with a template. And I'll just give an example of how uh, traditionally we might have done this uh, previously. You, you would get a template like that. You would go find a catalog pattern. You'd go to um, uh, uh, software you'd find on the internet. So I just pulled one up off the internet went to a circularly polarized or elliptically polarized antenna and found the best fitting pattern I could. So it looked like a three around panel to get that um, null around 270 to, to 180. <coughs> then you would rotate that pattern and we're using that null to, uh, to uh, fix that notch at about 20 to 30 degrees. And we had to scale it down a little bit because it still didn't quite um, do the trick, but you can see we're within the um, we're within the template there, and we used a catalog pattern. There may be better patterns available, but that was the only one that was elliptically polarized that I could find in the uh, in the planner to uh, to do that. So now I'll talk about a, another method, improved method. 
uh, rather than just saying here's a template and we've got to stay below this, maybe we can encroach further on the template and beyond the template and still, uh, still not interfere, not, not go above our interference level that we need to uh, hit. So perhaps we use a template as a starting point and then start increasing power in all directions until we've gone beyond uh, what what's, um, the interference target dictates. So we use the methods we talked about earlier, all the uh, changing the power and phase and all that, and also the optimizer that I talked about. <clears throat> so we want to protect, uh, in this case it was two stations against interference and maximize the ERP as much as we can everywhere else. Here's a flow chart of how we did it. Um, we ran TV study, or we didn't run TV study, the consultant ran TV study for one megawatt ERP antenna, omnidirectional. And um, from that, a course model was built of, from the TV study results. So it's a course model of, it's a course interference model uh, last year at IEEE we talked about fine and coarse models and linking them together to get speed in simulation where you, you don't run the full-blown uh, high, high fidelity model, you, you run a sort of a replica, replica of that which is a little bit coarse, a bit faster. Um, I, we, I can't take uh, credit for that. Um, the consultant Merrill built that model, provided it to us. But what it meant is within a second or so we could uh, put the pattern data in and get the interference numbers coming straight back. Obviously, uh, there's, there's cells in the interference model and in an antenna in our model, there's azimuth bearing, so we have to do conversions from blocks to uh, bearings and things like that, but th that all worked out quite well. So then we put our goals in. Um, the interference was, had to be no more than a certain level and we set some antenna metrics, um, basically how omni the pattern was. Any deviation from omni was sort of, we said as a bad metric, so we're gonna make it as omni as we can. And null, null depth and things were uh, also the goal. So we simulate it and we look at the interference, compare it with the goals, and um, the optimizer then will do its thing and keep simulating until uh, we, go, uh, we reach the target interference and then um, we give it back to the consultant and they run it again through TV study to just confirm that everything's good. So here's an example. Um, we st in this case we actually started with an omni and worked the other way, worked backwards, just reducing uh, the power. On the right is um, the, the error versus the um, simu uh, simulation. So you can see the first one, it rotated the pattern. So we had a peak in, a peak here where we uh, obviously, it's not a good point for a peak. And so the first one, it rotates it. And you can see the um, interference dropped quite a lot and the antenna uh, performance criteria, these two lines didn't change because we only rotated the pattern. Uh, then we did a, um, another rotation, it got a little bit worse. And another rate now we did a power reduction, or the optimizer did a power reduction here, and you can see the interference has dived down, but the pattern's not as good now because it's uh, it's no longer omni. Another another rotation, another rotation, so another power reduction the interference is going down further, um, and then it's started reducing this face here, and we've done a big reduction. We're below the target. We've got. Um, We've exceeded the target, but also the performance criteria of the antenna is going down. So then it's going to try and come up near this uh, target and try and increase the performance, which it did, but it overshot the interference. And now it's un undershot it, and um, we have a little bit of margin on that target, just to, to be sure. And so we've improved the performance as best we can and met the interference target. So with that first, just getting a catalog pattern straight out of the catalog, trying to use that, that's what we had. Uh, with this new technique where we um, 
optimise to the maximum allowable interference, I, I guess, and to get the best pattern, that's what we get. So in these sort of minor lobes around here, we, we're 2.4 dB down, whereas on that one we're 6 dB. And uh, the big difference is at the back here, uh, we, we're down 3 dB. And obviously yeah. we're encroaching this, um, this mask. We've got some areas where it's going over and somewhere it's going under, but the population, it's not sort of a linear thing. We, what we found is, what's well, pretty obvious, there's going to be pockets of population, so um, that works out okay. And so basically we ended up almost with an omnidirectional antenna. We, we couldn't use an omni, it still doesn't meet the interference criteria, but very small uh, reductions in, in the um, lobes on these two faces um, compared to the old method. So in conclusion, um, electromagnetic simulation combined with optimization is uh, fast and accurate, a good method for pattern replica replication and maximization. Um, using a catalog pattern doesn't always give an optimal result. If you optimize to a template, that gives you a better result, but still may not be quite optimum. And then using uh, different goals, the end goals, I guess, the interference, uh, the ERP in the other directions gives you a, a more optimum solution. So thank you. Mm.